Coming to you live from Madripoor, this is Optimal Play. I'm Brandon. I'm Troy. I'm Kyle. And uh, we are here to uh, teach my friends how to play Marvel Dagger. Hot, new, yet familiar board game for fantasy flight <laughs> games. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a, so yeah, this is a learn to play. Unlike some learn to plays you might be used to on YouTube, this is not scripted and it doesn't have beautiful B-roll. I just needed to teach specifically Troy how to play Marvel Dagger so that we could play Marvel Dagger. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're going to do it on camera in, in hopes that someone somewhere will find it useful. Let's do it. Let's do it. So uh, we have the game already set up, but I am going to touch on what setting up the game entails. Uh, we have each chosen a hero, and let me zoom in on it a little bit more. Uh, you choose one of the 20 heroes, they're double-sided, so you're playing as one side of one of the hero sheets, and you're choosing one of six aspects. That's all done at setup, so like I here am Hulk with the protection aspect, Troy, you are the Sorcerer Supreme, Stephen Strange, with the leadership aspect. So these two kind of fuse together to be your character sheet with your abilities and your actions. Uh, Kyle over there is the... You are uh, Black Panther. T'Challa, and he is for justice. He is justice -y today. <laughs> uh, so we've each chosen those. We, it looks like we haven't, but we should each have the action tokens that, that have the icon of the... Um, sure should. That, that have, are the, have the icon <laughs> of the aspects. Uh, we'll, we'll get that later, but imagine that we had three of those each. <laughs> Ooh, <wow. laughs> uh, four if it had been a two-player game. Uh, and then the board gets placed on the table. Where are you going? Sit down. Them. No. <laughs> <laughs> are they there? Just, just a quick question. Oh, these are them. Here. Okay, okay. Right. that's how I thought. Okay, so the board is on the table. Um, a few things about the board. We put the uh, little star here on the team-up track at the end here. We put the skull on the threat track at the zero. Uh, this six is actually highlighted by this token because that is the um, failure point for the first mission, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, we've also chosen a villain that we have over here to the right of the board. This is Loki. Um, along with the villain, we have randomly chosen a setup card. This is also this is our first. It's called the first strike mission. Uh, they all they all work pretty much the same. And your first mission will be to defeat an enemy or two. Uh, but what they do is they decide which set of enemies you're using. And so we're playing against the Black Order enemies. And so we have used kind of the symbol that was on that mission over here to set up the Black Order enemies and have their standees ready. Uh, by the way, these uh, the characters in this game all normally are in standees, but they play a lot better on camera if you lay them flat. So, so we're doing that. Um, okay, so we covered choosing the nemesis, choosing the heroes, kind of the, the rest of setup. Uh, oh, the nemesis. So, uh, Nemesis has an event deck. It's 12 cards. Uh, they have three signature Nemesis cards, Nemesis events, that need to go into this deck. You do that by creating four, uh, four sections of the deck, each one made up of three generic events from kind of a, a there's like 30 or so in the box, and the, uh, and one of the Nemesis's this is his signature <laughs> events. So basically every four cards in the deck will have three generic and one nemesis event shuffled together and then those three segments get stacked on top of each other. Kind of pandemic-ish. Yeah, exactly. Not, not that different from pandemic. Um, the, uh, the nemesis events do not have an order, so those three nemesis events could, could be in any order. What does have an order is the nemesis missions that are here under our first strike mission. So we've set up that mission stack with our first strike mission and then the three nemesis missions. I think all of the ones in the base game have three, have exactly three missions. Yep, so far. Um, and they all have a Roman numeral on them after their name, and so those missions should be in numerical order, not shuffled. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, we have uh, put some tokens at the, at the side of the board, we have set up our side mission deck, and we... Is that it? Did I, are there any components on the board that I didn't cover? Yes, there are. Uh, the heroes. Um, we went around starting with the first player, who is me on totally randomly, I assure you. Uh, <laughs> we each chose one of the five bases on the board, which are these hexagon art uh, tiles. We've each chosen one of those to start in and placed our hero there. We each have to start in a different one. Uh, Loki has started in space number 10 because it says space number 10 on his sheet here. 
And then finally, we have uh, selected a place to put the Iliad. One of our five bases is the flying airship, the Iliad. Uh, so this can actually, uh, the team decides which of the 15 numbered spaces this uh, begins the game on. There are, I don't know that there's a lot of ways to move it, but it is possible for it to move around. Um, the the learn to play rules suggest that you put it on space 8. I don't really know why, but... It's uh, bad, actually. Because it's right next to Wakanda. I mean, it's going to be right next to a base almost anywhere you put it. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> 4 seems like the farthest from all um, but I think there's one thing in the setup we didn't get, which was spawning the first enemies. Thank you. Yes. So the first strike mission, in addition to specifying which enemies we play with, it does tell you which to spawn and um, where to spawn them, depending on your player count, right? So what, mm -hmm. what, is, uh, so what does that say? This one top? says for two players uh, plus, so two or more players mm -hmm. would spawn a level one in space two. A so. rank one Black Order Infantry will go at space two. Okay. And because we are playing less than four players, no other ones get spawned. Okay, yeah, there, there are four, uh, four and five um, player spawns as well, so that the enemies, uh, the enemies scale to the number of players. Uh, lastly, there all is actually next to those a side mission symbol, so go ahead and draw a side mission and put it into play. Right next to it, we are kind of uh, due to table space. This is a big game. Uh, we we have these missions sideways, even though there we go. Okay, yeah, they would kind of fit here with each of these segments. Uh, so this part of the board is always going to be the nemesis mission, and then there's three spaces for side missions, which we've just filled one of them, and there's a space for the hero missions that we can elect to go on our our heroes' signature missions. Um, so this entered play, if it had had a location on it, this marker would go there to mark that, hey, space seven or whatever is, is where we go to uh, solve that mission. This one doesn't have one, so we'll just leave that token there. Uh, okay, I think that's set up. So what the hell are we doing? Beating up bad guys. We are beating up bad guys. Ultimately, that is what we're doing, is there is a nemesis, and we are trying to defeat it. To win, we need to get a Loki, in this case, our uh, our villain here. We're going to need to get him to flip so that we, we see his final showdown side, and then we will need to defeat him. Where, uh, for example, on this side, slight spoiler, I guess, we're not going to go into the text here. This will all apply during the final showdown. He has five hit points times the number of players. So we would need to do 15 damage once he gets to the final showdown. Uh, he flips over, and we start the final showdown when the entire Nemesis mission deck is done. I say done, not like... Uh, completed because we may or may not complete those missions. Each of those missions, when we uh, when we get to a new card in the deck, we are going to reset the threat track. So this is going to reset several times during the game, mm -hmm. and then we will use this marker and the uh, value on the card to mark where the at what threat level the mission will fail. And then we kind of set out to complete it in whatever way the card says you complete it before we fail it due to too much threat accumulating. And when we get to the nemesis phase, we'll, we'll talk about where threat comes from. But uh, yeah, you succeed or fail at each. But when you fail a mission, you don't lose the game. You uh, put it up here where there's nemesis mission spots. Um, if you succeed, you put it sh with the success text showing. And that will give us some benefit that will make our showdown with the nemesis at the end uh, easier. It'll tilt the balance in our favor. For each one that we fail, we will have the failure side tucked under the board showing here. And that will make our final showdown harder in some way. Okay, so we covered winning, defeat the nemesis in the final showdown. There are several ways to lose. The first of which is any player being defeated twice. So the first time that you're defeated by taking uh, damage in excess of your health value on your hero here, mine is nine, yours is four. <laughs> it's, a pre it's a pretty stark difference, yeah. actually, when I say that out loud. I'm stark. not Tony Stark. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 uh. So the first time that you're defeated, you are going to flip your hero and aspect cards. And that means the hero that you are playing as is down for the count. No one ever dies in these things, so I guess not dead, but... Um, and then kind of the associated hero that's on the other side of the card swings into action. If they're Spider-Man, find some other way to interaction <laughs> if they're a different character. And, uh, and then you're playing as them. And you'll flip your aspect card also, which I don't believe that has any mechanical impact other than it changes, the, it, changes it to like this shattered side that marks that you've been defeated once. 
Uh, if anyone gets defeated with their second hero, the entire game is over and we all lose. So we're not eliminating players, we are just uh, eliminating everyone. Is there any like window between when the second person is defeated and when the game ends, or is it immediately? Actually, that is a great question. Um, I believe it is at the end of the next hero phase okay. that we lose. So probably, not ne not always, but probably if a player is defeated, it's during the nemesis phase, and Makes we have sense. like one more hero phase without that player mm. to pull off a clutch victory. You'd have to be already in the final yeah. showdown and like <laughs> about to win the whole thing. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's a great mm. question. Okay. Second way we can lose is if we have all five of our bases overrun. And so there are these five bases on the board. It includes the Iliad and not Asgard, even though it has similar looking <laughs> aesthetics to it. Uh, the um, when We'll talk in a second when we get to the Nemesis phase about how the enemies activate and move around the board, but one of the things that they can do is overrun bases. When they do, we'll mark them with an overrun token, if you want to throw one out there, Kyle. Mm -hmm. There we go, Atlantis has been overrun. Bad Sad. news. Um, if all five bases are simultaneously overrun, we immediately lose the game. Uh, we also, also, lose the game if threat... Actually, I've only played one Nemesis, and it, it had a, a defeat condition during the final showdown of threat hitting 20. Mm -hmm. um, I don't actually know if every Nemesis is the same with that being a defeat condition, is threat hitting 20 during the final showdown, but, but there is... You can lose due to threat, but only during the final showdown, during missions, threat fails missions and then resets. It doesn't cause it to cause a defeat. And I think you said something that was a little confusing. It's simultaneously as in all five bases have been overrun in the course of the game. Uh, yes, yes. I don't know whether there are any ways in the mechanics of this game to to undo un it. to un overrun, to underrun a base. <laughs> <laughs> we can't just beat him up and kick him out? <laughs> uh, we cannot. No. 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 Once, it's, right. once it's overrun. And um, bases are considered, just as a side note, they are considered operational until they're overrun. Mm -hmm. So if you see something say, like, you can use an operational base, um, that's what that means. Underrun the base. Got it. Right. Uh, oh, I was forgetting one. I felt like I was forgetting a defeat condition. Uh, based on our playthrough earlier, Kyle, we didn't come anywhere close to this, but you also lose if you oh, need yeah. to draw an event card from the, from the 12 card event deck that you set up and can't. Yeah. So basically you lose after 13 rounds. I think mm. that we finished our game and we're very close to losing, but one, and like eight. round seven, eight, yeah, yeah we like were that. not close to that at all. So I don't know how uh, reasonable that, that is to happen, but hmm. yeah. Um, Okay, so what we do, uh, the hero phase, we, the game begins with the hero phase and every uh, round of the game has a hero phase. Uh, this is where we take our actions to defeat enemies, defy missions, uh, fight the nemesis, anything else that, that we need to do uh, to, to work towards that final, that final mission. So um, we have three of these, these are called our aspect tokens each. Again, that would be four for a two player game. And if I can zoom in on this, you can see on mine, hopefully it's picking up on camera okay. One of them has this like sunburst in the color of my aspect. Two of them do not. This is considered, this is called my boosted aspect token. And these are just aspect tokens. Uh, what we're going to do is starting with the first player, which will rotate each round. We're going to take one action by placing one of these aspect tokens into one of these circles, either on our sheets on the board, they uh, on some of the other nemeses, it is possible for them to be on the nemesis itself or on missions. Anywhere that you see one of these white circles, you can uh, put your token to take an action. So it's almost a little bit like worker placement vibe, yeah. uh, even though it doesn't end up playing feeling that much like, no. a, like a worker placement game. Um, so to kind of go through uh, the, the basic action, so Everyone has on their aspect card, move, fight, defy, and arrest. Uh, which aspect you are, in addition to a um, kind of passive ability that I'll let you uh, explore on your own, dear viewer, uh, two of them are highlighted, which means that those actions, because of your, your aspect, are different in some way from other people's. So my, my move and my rest are highlighted here, which means that, that is, those are kind of what uh, the protection aspect specializes in. But they all do the same basic things, which are to move. Uh, this will say move and then a, a value. Move, it's usually one or two. You simply, uh, if you take that action, you can move your hero that many times along these 
lines that connect spaces. You can go into the ocean spaces that don't actually have numbers on them. You can totally leave spaces with enemies in them. They don't prevent you from moving or, or do an opportunity attack, anything like that. Simply move. <laughs> um, when you, let's see, where's an enemy? Let's bring this enemy over to me. The uh, Hulk. Uh, <laughs> when you fight, this is where you start actually testing your skills here, which are printed like mine as the Hulk. I have three attack, one defy, one tactics skill. So uh, these next three test your skills. Fight says attack an enemy in your space. When you attack, you will roll dice equal to the number in your attack stat. So as the Hulk here, I'm going to roll three dice. And when you're testing attack, the symbols you want to see on the dice are this like explosion symbol that we can kind of see here. It's a little, a little tough to pick that up on, on camera with an overhead camera. Uh, here I've rolled three of them. Each of those is considered a success, and what a success on a, a fight does is it deals one damage to the enemy that you are fighting. You do have to decide which one enemy you are fighting with that action. You can't like spread those out between them. Uh, the one other thing that you can always roll on the dice is this lightning bolt symbol. That is a wild. That always counts on a success as a success no matter what you're testing. Ooh. And these uh, bases have abilities on them. You can see Madripoor here says prime one enemy. We can talk in a second about what priming it means. Uh, but for each wild that you roll, in addition to it counting as a success, you can trigger, this is the dagger ability, Dagger, by the way, is an acronym like Marvel loves to do with shield and stuff. I don't know what it stands for. It's on the box. Uh, sure is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you can use the dagger ability of the base in your region. So I don't even have to have been in Madripoor. I could be here. And when I rolled that wild, I can prime one enemy since that's the base in my region. Um, I cannot mm. do that once the base is overrun. I lose the ability to do that. And if there were two bases in my region because the Iliad was there, I would choose one of them to resolve, not both. So... Kind of continuing on the actions. The defy action says, uh, defy a mission in your space. You'll test your defy skill. You're looking for this kind of swirly looking symbol to be successes. Um, defying a mission doesn't do anything unless there's missions in play that want to be defied, that, that mm -hmm. tell you defy it at a certain space or in a certain circumstance. And then in that case, it could be something like you defy this mission while you're in the space of the hero with the highest tactics skill, or it could be while you're in space number five, or it could be while you're in the nemesis space. Whatever it is, if you're in a valid space to do it, you choose the mission you're defying before you roll. You roll your defy skill, in that's the quantity of dice that you roll, and then for each defy icon that you roll, you get one success and put one progress on that mission. I can't read this mission and don't really care to, but why don't you demonstrate a progress token? It's Ooh. those cool little hourglass things. <laughs> so uh, that is the main way that we, uh, or that is uh, primarily used to advance through the Nemesis missions, completing them before threat causes us to fail them, and getting those side missions that have negative consequences on us, uh, the more, they, more of them that accumulate on the table, getting those done and cleared off the table. Uh, you can also roll wilds on those, and wilds uh, do the same thing when you're fighting as when you're defying as when you're resting. Anytime you roll, roll a wild, it's a success, and you can trigger the base in your area. Uh, so last is rest. You'll, uh, you'll test your tactics skill. For me, that's just one die as the Hulk. Um, for each, it, uh, it will also, I think the rest actions all tell you to add one or more successes, so it's a lot of the time it's, your, it's a lower stat. Oh, not for you. You've got four. Nope. <laughs> uh, but, but, but you get some automatic successes. So uh, for each success that you get when you uh, rest, you can, and you can, this one, unlike Defy and Fight, which have to all go into one target, sort of, uh, for each success, you can make a choice to recover one, which means remove a damage from uh, your hero, uh, or charge one, and charge one is used to earn these character abilities. You, we started with one of our choice face up, which means ready, one face down, which is exhausted. Uh, I don't know how well this plays on camera, but this face down ability of mine it says it has a two hourglass on it. That means it needs to be charged twice and we'll use those same progress tokens mm -hmm. in order to ready it, which turns it face up. For example, mine here says, before you roll for an attack or tactics test, you can exhaust this card to roll one additional die. So my gamma radiation, I now once I've readied it by charging it, I can use this on any roll that I want to add a die, then it'll go back to its exhausted state and I need to charge it up again, getting two more progress on it via this rest action or anything else mm. that grants charging. 
in order to use it again. So those don't ready each round or anything. They, they only ready by you putting progress tokens on them when you, by charging them. Um, so those are the four basic abilities that uh, kind of touched on the, um, the hero ability cards as well. A few other things that heroes can do. Uh, one is I, you saw that there's these uh, circles where you can put your aspect tokens on the uh, bases. If you do that, it's simple. You, so first you have to be there, so that was almost a bad example. Uh, <laughs> but you simply do the dagger effect in that region, as if you had rolled a wild, it does the same thing. I would prime one enemy as my action. Also when you do that, you can take your hero's signature mission and put it here, and now it is another mission that the team is on. Um, there's some risks with that, because like most side missions, they tend to have detrimental effects on us while they are there. But they, uh, when you complete your hero's mission, you unlock this card that's face down with that same kind of mission symbol. Um, in this case, like Rick Jones for the Hulk, it increases my tactics attribute by two. So they generally have some uh, passive ability that you turn this face up, you're never exhausting it or anything. They just have some uh, good impact that, in my experience, is, is well worth going on the mission. Yeah. Uh, you can just only have one mission there, and the way that you, you activate those is by taking that, uh, that dagger action in any base. Um, and then since there's only one circle here, only one player can use each base, right? Like a worker placement game, that's, that's taken. Um, then there's also team-up abilities. So I have Hulk Smash here. It has a six on it. Uh, to ready this card, similar to my other abilities, when it's face down, it's exhausted, I ready it by doing something. In this case, it is spending this team up resource. So in a, a couple different ways, this we can increase this track. This is like a shared team resource that we kind of have to collaborate and decide how we're going to spend it. But what it's for is charging these team up abilities. Like Hulk Smash costs six to ready, so I can spend that six at any time during my turn flip this, and then I can use this immediately or down the road at some point. Uh, Hulk Smash, for example, says, exhaust this card to deal a damage to an enemy in your space or recover one, then repeat this process five more times. Uh, so they're cool. They're splashy. I think Doctor Strange's gives us all an extra action for a round. Like, they're, they're cool stuff. Um, but you have to decide as a team how you're using that resource. So the, the ways that you get that are um, the side missions have a little number and a star that is very unlikely to, maybe you can see it there, but it's, it's, it's real small. <laughs> um, uh, when you complete that side mission, you gain that much team up. And then we haven't really looked at our hero abilities yet, right? Each hero has three abilities on them. Some of them may be tokens that, uh, or maybe circles where you put an action token, an aspect token rather, and take that action. Others may just be passive abilities or that, that apply at a certain time. Um, so there are, everyone has at least one combo ability. You can see that mine here is highlighted in blue. It's called Rampage. You have two of them called you. Bend Time and Illusion Magic. So those always revolve around these tokens called Prime Tokens and Empowered Tokens, which we'll look at in just a moment. But, uh, so in order to do those things, to either trigger them when they should be triggered or when you'd like to trigger them or to spend an action on them, those tokens are going to play into it being you being eligible to do so. But then when you do, they grant the team one team of power. So every time any of us uses one of those actions, we get one team Ooh, up. Okay. With one point of team up. I don't know what, what do you call a unit of team up? One teamwork. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then we all have to high five at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. Otherwise, we don't get the point. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Look at the elbows when we find. Yeah. I'm gonna go across. Go there you go. Ready? Okay. Yeah, I'm it's on you guys to hit yeah. that. I can't. Right. <laughs> it just puts the target there for us. Yeah. It's <laughs> our teamwork that needs to be. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, and I find that a little bit hard to remember. I think when we played, we we a couple times were like, wait, last turn did we use that? Should we have one more team up? But anyway, uh, you you gain team up from from those actions. Um, and then, so, Empowered and uh, Prime Tokens, they get, uh, heroes can be empowered, and they are these orange tokens Kyle is putting out. There we go. Uh, so you're, you're empowered. How do you feel? I feel great. I feel I, empowered. I, I bet you would. Uh, and then you Prime Enemies by putting these on the map, uh, point, pointing at an enemy like this. Uh, so, when a hero is empowered, kind of, it means two things. It means that you can 
uh, do things that you can only do when empowered. Uh, if the ability, like you and I both have one, if the ability is templated, like empowered colon do something, that means it consumes your empowered token. You're, you're spending the token in addition to, to, in my case, taking an action to do that. Okay. Um, if it doesn't say that, if it just says like, if you're empowered, you can do this, then it, yeah. does, then it does not consume that token. Uh, mm -hmm. But but you you need to be empowered generally to do those team ups. Um, but the other thing that you can do with an empower token is you can always add a success to any skill test that you take by spending that token. Okay. Uh, you can only you're either empowered or not, so you can you can only have one token. You can't get a bunch of them. Um, so so you can always spend that for plus one success. And then the priming enemies is pretty similar. Like Loki here is is now primed. Um, specifically when you attack a primed enemy, you may spend that primed token on that enemy to add one success to your attack. And you do, in both cases, you do that after rolling, which is pretty powerful. So you, mm -hmm. you know whether you need that success or not and, and can not, not waste the token if you don't need it. Uh, and then also priming the enemy is, it's the other effect that plays into these combo abilities being, being doable. Uh, did I talk really about the boost token? It's pretty simple. I'm not sure that I did. You did not. I mentioned that you have uh, one aspect token that is uh, has this starburst of your aspect's color. This is your boost token. So specifically on these actions, some of them will have boost text. If you use that boost token in that slot, then you apply the boost, uh, the boost text as well. For example, my move action says move two, but if I boost it, Increase this action's move value by one. You and each other hero in each space you move into or out of may recover one. So when I when I boost my move, I can uh, trample my way across the world, smashing you all with my healing fists, as as Hulk does. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, uh, naturally, that's what Hulk does. Yeah, like, punch with love. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and that's coming from protection. So the game's not saying Hulk actually heals with his fists. But he does. Uh, but what I'm saying is that Hulk heals with his fists. <laughs> yeah, the best that. defense is a good offense. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Her best healing is getting punched in the face. <laughs> Doesn't kill you, make you stronger. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, okay, a couple other things that you can see on the board uh, before we move on to the Nemesis phase, and then that will cover everything, I think. Uh, Asgard, there's a space here. You can't move there. Sorry. Sucks to be all of us. Rude. Um, there is this, uh, this, so Asgard is a distant place with a kind of a, a rainbow bridge of sorts that can, can portal people there. That is represented by this token. Uh, when a game effect, including if you rest in Asgard, when a game effect lets you, you can move this to a space, like say it's in the Bifrost token is in Central Europe now. Now these two spaces are adjacent to each other. So now you can, uh, move to Asgard from Asgard to Central Europe or vice versa and so you could you know move from Central Europe to Asgard take a rest there which will heal you and charge you as normal and also move the Bifrost token and then leave and get to southern uh, the uh -huh. southern cone <laughs> which I just noticed that space is called That's a that way choice of a name um yeah <laughs> yeah, I never even realized that. <laughs> so, so that is the Asgard uh, thing. I know I said that there were a couple things because I figured more would occur to me, but that's that's it. I just want to confirm one thing. Yeah, uh, Atlantis here is only you can only count it as being in the same zone as Atlantis is if you're in the water. If you're in Correct. any of these blue ocean spaces, yep. yes, then that is what you can trigger with the wild. Yeah, Great. yeah, Atlantis that lets you recover to or charge to. Um, Okay, the uh, Nemesis phase comes after we've completed all of our actions. We just go uh, one action at a time until, so for a three-player game, we would collectively take nine actions. And then the Nemesis phase comes. Um, three things happen. The um, threat increases, then we check mission success or failure, and then we resolve a Nemesis event. And so, so to go, go a little bit more into each of these, um, threat increases from a... A lot of sources. <laughs> you add together a bunch of things. Um, threat is going to increase by whatever threat value is. Let me zoom in on the villain here. Printed on the villain. For Loki, it's three. And then Ooh. also, it's going to increase by one for each non-nemesis enemy on the board. So right now, there's just this one Black Order infantry. Uh, so we're up to four. Uh, missions may have threat values, and that can, that's uh, primarily side missions or hero missions that contribute to threat also. So 
that that could, uh, and that's just depending on the value that's printed there. And then each overrun base contributes one threat. So that is another reason to keep bases from being overrun is not only is it a defeat condition, all five of them, and you can't use their dagger ability anymore, but they generate one threat per round for the rest of the game. It's, it's real bad. Real when that, when that starts happening. threat fills up a lot faster than I expected it to. It does. It does. So like this first strike uh, mission that has a six threat threshold, you might just trigger it at, at the end of the first round of the game, depending on, on how that goes. Uh, um, I understand why this thing can go up to 20 then. Yeah, yeah. The, the Nemesis missions that I've seen it had more like a 12 to 16 threshold, so then you have a couple rounds. Yeah. yeah but but yeah, it goes, it goes by fast. Just kill oh. everything and don't let any bases get a run, Troy. It's easy. <laughs> exactly. <P>. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so the next thing that you do is you check the mission uh, to see whether it succeeds or fails. The good news is you check whether it succeeds first, which means that even if the threat is past the threshold, if you've completed the success conditions, you succeed it, not fail it. Hey. Uh, so, so as Kyle has demonstrated there, he's put three progress on there. So even if threat was at eight... Uh, we only needed three, which was one times the number of players, to, to complete the first strike mission, so we would complete it. Had we not completed it, then we would check whether threat was, is too high, is at or above the marker that we placed on the track, and we would fail it. Either way, we're going to look at the card to see what happens. Um, and then uh, once we're on to the Nemesis missions, which is the second, third, and fourth in the stack beyond the first strike ones, those are the ones that will be tucked up here, always cause a side mission to also be drawn, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next thing. Um, also, every time a mission is resolved, succeed or fail, you reset the threat to zero. So it so it's, uh, starts over for each mission. Um, the last thing that happens in the Nemesis phase is a Nemesis event. So it might look something like this. Minor setback. Um, in, instead of art, it has some text. So, you know, I hope, I hope you like... Reading. I hope you like generic, re real generic, <laughs> real generic. <laughs> flavor text like auxiliary forces have been delayed. Support is on the way, but you'll have to continue alone. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're they're all they're all, they're all that they're all that yeah, good. Yeah, they're, they're all you know. at least that good. Yeah. Like uh, so there's a few there's a few features here. Uh, here it, it says in the text, which is what you do first. Each hero discards all progress tokens from their support cards. So any partially charged. Uh, support abilities that you had that would be uh, that would be lost and then there's a series of icons on this card that you're gonna start on this left side and basically follow all the way around the bottom uh, so the first ones are icons that can be a few different things uh, this exclamation point icon we have on the example here is going to cause us to draw a side mission and again side missions uh, if you've if you played games with side quests, those that sounds like a good thing. Side missions in this game are bad. That's that's a pure downside uh, to to draw that. Um, another icon that is not on this example but can be on these cards is the uh, ongoing ability card. It's these two little arrows. Uh, there is one on here. Uh, when that happens, when that icon is on the event, um, all of those the text on all those cards of that symbol triggers at that time. So we go through them all. We resolve them all. There's two examples over there. We don't need to, to spend time on what they do, but they all happen. If you've played Elder, uh, not Elder Sign, Eldritch Horror, it's exactly like Reckonings. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, the exact, it's the exact same yep. mechanic. This game has a few things in common with, with Eldritch Horror for sure. Then there are three possible icons. Uh, there's a bomb here, but uh, there's also a like uh, sciency flask and a meteor. Uh, when those when those icons are on the event, they trigger that specific ability from the nemesis. So so that's a way that this is this is a generic event card that any nemesis could have. But what it actually does is a little different depending on the nemesis. In this case, it would trigger Loki's chaotic wake ability, which which uh, oh we, we we and the viewers can look at those on their own time. Um, then we come down here, I believe. Uh, don't quote me on, you know, don't comment when you see exceptions to this, but every event that I've ever seen had this icon, which is to activate enemies. Uh, so every enemy is going to activate in the order of its rank, and they uh, follow a really basic script. And so the, the rank is this kind of symbol here. This is rank one, two, three. Uh, these illusory foes, which are, are uh, Loki specific, I believe are considered rank four. And the nemesis goes last. Oh. What enemies are going to do is they're going to uh, do whichever thing on this list I'm about to recite, that the first thing that they can do, they're going to do it. Uh, first, they want to attack a hero, which will just, they will simply, uh, they have this uh, power value. Um, they have actually a health value in green and a power value in blue. 
uh, they will do that much damage to a hero in their space. If there's multiple heroes in the space, we choose who they attack. Uh, if they can't do that, they try to overrun a base in their space. Uh, so any, even the little rank one minions can overrun a base, permanently ruining it for everyone. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, so every enemy is scary in that way. If they're in if they're in a space and there's no hero for them to attack, they will overrun that base. Mm -hmm. um, and then if they are not uh, able to attack a hero or overrun a base, whether it's because it's already overrun or there's no base in their space, they move. Uh, they move towards the nearest base in their region, meaning that. Uh, if they're down here in South America, they, well, actually, this is a weird example, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> they will move into Atlantis, but they're moving into Atlantis because that is the shortest path to New York, which was the base in their region. Hmm. It's weird. Uh, and then once they're in Atlantis, they're in a different region, so they would not continue their move to New York. It, it, it's, it's, it's a little weird, but that's how it works. They move towards the closest base in their region. If there's no operational base in their region, then they move towards the closest base, period. I don't know why I ended that with the intonation that there was going to be a third fact. There's that totally is, a third that fact. That is all the facts. Fact <laughs> yeah. number three. Uh, uh, do they move one space? They do move one space, thank you. Um, and so that's what all the enemies do, with kind of two uh, exceptions. Um, every enemy has text on their card that you should uh, look at when they activate to see what they do. Actually, you should probably look at it uh, at the start of the game and remind yourself frequently because it doesn't all have to do with their activation. This infantry, for example, says that when Black Order infantry moves, it moves towards the nearest hero. So that's actually an exception to what, to what we said about it moving towards bases. Mm -hmm. um, the other exception is that nemeses, the, the nemesis, nemesises, uh, when they activate, they do follow generally the same steps, but if they attack if they attack heroes, they attack all heroes in their space, not one of our choice. That's, mm. that's the one difference. Otherwise, they work the same as, as minions for, for, uh, for that activation. And then the last thing on this card is these are the same types of uh, symbology we saw on the first strike mission. We spawn more enemies. So we use, uh, we use these symbols to show the rank of the enemy. In this case, it's the nemesis-specific illusory foe and the space where it spawns, which is 11. So we don't actually have those on the table for some reason, but we would put one on space 11. Uh, and that also has little dots there that correspond to player count. So for a three-player game, it's, it would just be that, that one here. Uh, so that's it. That's the nemesis phase. And then the uh, first player, this dagger token, passes clockwise. So someone else will be first in the next round. And then uh, only now is when we take back our aspect tokens from all the actions that we took. Uh, because sometimes where they're sitting during the nemesis phase matters. So you do wait until the nemesis phase mm -hmm. is done. Um, and, then, and then we repeat. Then we're back to the hero phase, taking our actions again. I have a question, Brandon. Kyle. Yes. So until the final showdown, does Loki just chill? What does he do? Is he invincible? How does that work? That is an excellent question. Thanks. <laughs> I know. <laughs> this is why when we do this, it's nice to do it. I, I like to have someone who legitimately doesn't know who's learning, and also someone who does know and can help me uh, yeah. help keep me honest. Uh, you can attack the nemesis anytime that you're in its space, or anytime that an effect would let you, you know, do, deal damage from a distance or something. Uh, but the nemesis, when it flips for the final showdown, uh, it's going to fully heal. So this is not damage that is helping you with the final showdown. What it does do, as you uh, damage, for example, Loki with your attacks, um, is it stuns the, uh, stuns the nemesis. So when there's damage equal to or greater than the health printed on the front side of this card, you will, <laughs> thank you, I was one damage short, you will stun the nemesis. Um, that only does one thing, and that is the Nemesis skips its next, uh, like, enemy activation. It is still able to resolve its special abilities if those icons are on the event card, but it does not do the move over run a base attack heroes step. Uh, it skips that entirely, and at that time, you remove the stun and all damage on it. So even if you had gone above and beyond the amount to stun it, that's all going to be wasted. It's going to clear away. And uh, then it's no longer stunned and can go about its business as usual. Uh, we actually found that, that stunning it, when, when we first set up the game and like had learned from the rule book and we're gonna go, I was like, I don't know if you're gonna waste five, you know, five successes worth of damage on stunning the nemesis. Turns out it's actually pretty important it's pretty good. to do. 
Uh, otherwise, he's going to rampage around, uh, either dealing a lot of damage or overrunning a lot of bases. So. Well, it turns out, like, if they're on the board and you can't get them off the board and they just slowly move towards bases, they're going to overrun lots of bases. <laughs> turns out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, Loki can... Oh, I think I missed the part where you said Loki can overrun bases. Oh, yeah. Just, 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 like just, just like any other enemy. Uh, j he oh, he boy. Try, tries to attack heroes. If he can't, he All tries to overrun a base. If he can't, he moves. Goodbye, yeah. Wakanda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and he moves up following the same rules. He moves towards the uh, base in his region. If he can't, he moves towards the closest base. Uh, Wakanda I, forever, Troy. Don't say that. I, I, th I, think, I think that's it. I think that's Marvel Dagger. I think that's Marvel Dagger. Yeah. Yeah, easy as that. Simple game, right? Yeah. 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 Very, very light. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't take up a lot of table space. Quick cleanup. Really good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not a million different words you gotta learn. Whatever. <laughs> Uh, so we're gonna call that a video, but we are, uh, we here are going to stay here and play a game of Marvel Dagger. Actually, not against Loki, because no. Kyle and I have done that before. Uh, yeah. we're, we're taking on Thanos today. We're taking so, on the big man. Yeah. I the, want big his rings. <laughs> the big purple man. The big purple man, yes. Barney? <laughs> we're coming for him. <laughs> yep. Or uh, Grimace? You're next, Barney. <laughs> your next Grimace is actually far more topical. Yeah. <laughs> so, so join us for this. If you're watching this video on the day we posted it, that will be up the following day. If you're watching us on live stream, we are streaming on YouTube as we record this. Uh, so those the, the streaming viewers have been able to see the technical issues and everything. <laughs> that, that <laughs> out of this. Yeah. Uh, then stick around. We're going to do that really shortly. Um, with that, yeah, thank you very much. I hope this was helpful. If it was or wasn't, uh, we'd love if you would like the video and subscribe <laughs> to the channel. Uh, those are literally the only ways to support Optimal Play and they cost you nothing, so why not? Agreed. Uh, all right, we'll see you for the playthrough when uh, Thanos probably wipes the floor with us. Should be good. <laughs> Till then, be optimal.